Thank you everyone for uh, sticking out the morning. I'm uh, keeping you from, or I'm in between you now and lunch, so I will talk very fast, hopefully not too fast, so hold on, here we go. A little bit of a, a, can everybody hear me okay? I hate these things. I like to have mobile ones. And, but, uh, uh, outline here, give you a little bit about a uh, background about the project, the planning processes that we tried to merge, uh, some of the ongoing research with the Vermilion project, public engagement, which was critical and has been touched on by some of the other groups, the recommendations in the plan, the plan is done, but now it's just the beginning, and implementation, next steps now for that, and acknowledgement. Uh, Les had a map up earlier. The Vermilion is in uh, the downstream section or east central area of Alberta, downstream part of the North Saskatchewan watershed uh, WPAC area. Uh, it's about 7,800, a little over 7,800 square kilometers in size. And there's about, uh, with all the member municipalities, urban and rural, a population of about 57, just about 57,000 people. So, this project started originally back as a concept way back in 2004. At the time, there was a bunch of agencies uh, working in and around the geographic area of the Vermilion River watershed, as well as there was coordinating programs such as, at that time, uh, the APF, the Agricultural Policy Framework. Uh, for those of you that might not know, agriculture in the province and in Canada were somewhat similar to in the States. There's the Farm Bill, five-year blocks of policy and funding and programs. Well, in 2003, there was the APF, Agricultural Policy Framework, and that started a lot of the work. If you sat in yesterday on the EPF presentation, Perry Phillips talked about the BMP programming and the environmental farm planning and all that stuff. And not the BMP started in 2003. We've been doing BMPs, agricultural BMPs, for over 20 years, if not more. But APF then in 2008 turned into what we called Growing Forward. Again, another five-year block of BMP programming, agricultural, fed prov, federal, provincial, agricultural policy kind of stuff. And now we're coming into April 1 of this year, 2013, what they call Growing Forward. So it's agricultural policy framework, then Growing Forward, and now Growing Forward 2, or Son of Growing Forward as I call it. But Back at this time, there was, through the APF, the start of the National Farm Stewardship Program. So through that, if producers did do the environmental farm plans, they were then eligible for cost-shared assistance to adopt beneficial management practices. And we can map, again, the uptake from some of those programs as far as the range of BMPs. In Alberta at that time, I think there was a, call it a menu list of over 26 uh, BMPs that were available for various proportions of cost-shared assistance. Sadly, the BMP programs are usually very oversubscribed. The, the funding runs out quickly and it's government uh, red tape and all that stuff. I apologize for that. But under going forward, they had a new suite of BMPs. Some of them were the same, um, but it was slightly different format. Uh, the province delivered a lot of that on its own. Co the whole purpose of that model watershed program, we thought, well, with the work going on in the Vermilion, could we actually target a watershed and actually do some of this coordinated, multi-sector, multi-agency kind of effort and really get in and, and make a difference in the landscape? Also, 2005, about that time, NSWA did the State of the Watershed Report, and what also drove that process was the Vermilion out of the 12 sub-watersheds in the entire NSWA it was deemed the most altered. Uh, again, some of the structures and channelization and, and stuff that had been done in the Vermilion back in the mid-70s based on a, a very extreme uh, 1974 extreme flood event had really altered that riverine system. And as a tributary to the NSWA, again, the NSWA wanted something done there. As you can imagine, the history of the Vermilion, though, for a lot of the landowners, it didn't just go back to 2003, or it didn't go back to 1974. There was a rich history there, almost Hatfield and McCoy-ish. We joke about it now because 
we eventually were able to bring the partners to the table in 2009. And I've told this at different conferences before, we've joked to this day that if things get heated in a discussion, uh, well, one day the guy said, one of the guys said, well, uh, can you imagine we're sitting around this table and, and in the old days we would have hung one another. And the one guy whispered, well, the rope's still out in the back of my truck. <laughs> So anyway, it's a very lengthy process, and, and some of the other watershed uh, projects have mentioned this. These things don't happen overnight. The other thing I'd like to mention is we thought we'd be able to get the initial plan done within a two-year window, two to three-year window, and fall time 2010, something impacted a lot of our municipal representation called the municipal election cycle. So we had to take two steps back, get started again, get everybody back up to speed, so there was a little bit of delay there. <coughs> uh, again, as far as the, the member municipalities, in total, Vermillion touches or covers eight different rural municipalities. Uh, however, four are representative on the steering committee, just because the uh, municipalities such as Flagstaff and Camrose, it's just a very, very tiny area. County of St. Paul, very, very tiny area and Lamont County, we keep them abreast of some of the developments, but again, it's a very, very small portion. The bulk is in Beaver County, County of Minburn, County of Two Hills, and County of Vermilion River. Our urbans on the committee are Town of Vegreville and Vermilion, and they represent over 14 urban municipalities, hamlets, and uh, essentially urban municipalities. Also on our committee is um, Vermilion River Operations Advisory Council, or committee. They're the group that take care of the operations of all of the structures, uh, control, flow control structures on the Vermilion. Lakeland College is a member. The Holden Drainage District, uh, one of the, I'm not sure how many drainage districts there is in the province, but they're a unique animal. Holden's been in place since 1918. They have actual legislative authority for taxation and land control, so they're an interesting, uh, very interesting stakeholder. And again, the history of some of the drainage districts, uh, you know, decades ago they were paid to drain. Well, now we've got guys that want to hold back water. They realize the value of the water. Uh, I also forgot to mention when this started, we were in the midst of the 2009 drought. We'd had two back-to-back -back droughts in the early 2000s, and the issue around sustainable water supplies, both groundwater and surface water, were front and foremost um, with, the, with the stakeholders. How fast things changed though. Last summer we were, you know, Alberta Environment guys, or ESRD were screaming about, uh, you know, the flooding. So, funny how things change. In the land use planning processes though, I want to talk, and, and Bill, gave a, Bill Shaw gave an excellent presentation yesterday with some of the work that they've been doing with Clearwater County. And an understanding of land use planning processes as they exist in Alberta and in provinces across Canada. Yes, we have land use framework and we have ELSA, but before that we have, and it still exists, although it's under review, so I want to put a tidbit out there for the WPACs and are the people that aren't involved or engaged in municipal affairs review of the MGA right now. Uh, that is an opportunity, I think. But we have formal and informal planning in Alberta. Formal is legislated. Is there an act, is there a law that governs land use planning? Yes. In Alberta, it's an MGA, Municipal Government Act. And there's, what types of planning do we have? We have as formal, we have municipal, obviously, regional, land use planning. We also have something from the late 1970s, a formal planning system called IRM, Integrated Resource Management, typically on public lands. Then we have informal. This is the voluntary planning that we essentially in Alberta call watershed planning. Could be conservation-based planning, could be uh, again issue or community volunteer again. This is where watershed planning in Alberta fits. The informal planning how do we marry that with the formal? I do want to note that there is formal watershed planning in Canada. In Ontario, we have conservation authorities. We, they have conservation authorities. And Manitoba, they have conservation districts. Actually, legislated watershed planning. Here in Alberta, if you Google 
or search the word watershed in ELSA, Alberta Land Stewardship Act, or in the Water Act, or in the MGA, although it was said in the last presentation, is it actually in MGA? It says rivers, lakes, and exactly. You cannot <laughs> find the word watershed in any of those three pieces of legislation. We have an issue here. <coughs> So again, from a formal land use planning side, the provincial government has the mandate and the legislative authority through, in Alberta, the MGA since 1995. We have provincial land use policies since 1996. They exist. Does anybody know about them? Not many. Uh, but in most provinces across Canada, again, this is the process, this responsibility is officially transferred to lower levels of government. So municipalities or local governments, your rural, your urbans, have this delegated authority for land use planning. And that takes on the form then a statutory planning document. Your MDP, the Municipal Development Plan, that's the overall umbrella that guides development in municipality for 10 to 15 years usually. Intermunicipal development plans, now they're typically urban to rural, like if you have an urban municipality within a rural, they often have IDPs, Intermunicipal Development Plans. Our Vermillion guys are interested in pursuing uh, a large IDP for the entire watershed. So I'll talk about that a little bit later. And area structure plans, they're usually site specific, but there have been examples of them being done on watershed areas. City of Calgary, Rocky View have done ASPs related to uh, usually stormwater or uh, uh, it's kind of site specific. Usually they're under a quarter section. Uh, 160 acres, but they are. And then uh, non-statutory plans, again, that's land use bylaws. That's where your land zoning comes in, your zoning maps, what you can actually do or can't do on the land. Watershed planning, the tact that we took, was essentially we had to build the partnership. Again, there's a rich history, as I mentioned. We had to characterize the watershed, gather the information, the data, do the GIS, the mapping, identify issues, then the goals, the solutions, and the recommendation and implementation. That's kind of the format we took. Throughout that whole process, we were cognizant of trying to find that fit into the formal planning process. So working with municipalities, first and foremost, was a high priority for the Vermilion. Here's my list. I should have had this earlier. I'm sorry I had them out of order. All of our partners, in the project, NSWA, of course, without the technical support of NSWA and some of the funding support, uh, it wouldn't have happened. Alberta NAWAMP, uh, North American Water Fowl Management Plan, uh, they were a key partner. NUMEC, uh, Northeast Alberta Water Management Coalition. Again, they're uh, not as active anymore, but uh, in 2009, they were an uh, a consortium of about 12 to 14 rural municipalities in East Central Alberta looking again at trying to garner or secure water supplies. Counties, I mentioned the towns, Holden, Vermilion River Operations Advisory Committee, Lakeland, oh and of course Alberta Environment and SRD. In the early days we had Rick Friedel, uh, Operations Manager from Central Region out of Red Deer here uh, on the committee and uh, currently we have Dave Mussel uh, out of uh, out of Spruce Grove? Or, yeah, thank you. And we had funding the initial years from Alberta NAWAMP, $60,000 a year from NAWAMP, and then I had a little bit of uh, project money uh, that ends next year if they approve it for the last year of the program with the mess that Alberta, uh, at uh, Ag Canada that we're in. So in characterizing the watershed, one of the things that was really important, and I'll talk a little bit with the research, is how do you characterize the the watershed. The hydrology depends on our landscape, our landforms, and how water runs off the, the landscape is totally dependent on your relief, your slope length, and your off-site drainage, and as well as an indication also of watershed density. So in areas that are either level to undulating or gently rolling, you have typically very long slopes, you have moderate to high uh, slope gradients, your watershed density might be quite low, which is usually a factor of every 100 uh, hectares. And your off-site drainage is usually very, very high. In Hummocky, 
kind of pothole knob and kettle, you know, our typical prairie pothole area. Hummocky landscapes, the slope gradients may be a little bit higher. Slope length, definitely shorter because there are more pockets, more of those little knobs and kettles. Watershed density, very, very high, much higher than if it's level and undulating. And your off-site drainage, again, is quite low. So understanding this helps lead then into how the understanding of watersheds and how, you know, and that's another thing we found out. Municipalities, the planners and, and folks, they understand drainage. A lot of people understand drainage. But they actually, in some of our consultations, they wanted to, us to change the word watershed. They didn't like the word watershed. <laughs> and you're kind of, okay, well. <laughs> so, um, and I hope you can see this at the back. This just is a map of the landforms. You can see the outline of the Vermilion River watershed. The greens, the darker the greens get, the more hummocky they are. Again, that knob and kettle kind of pop holy. The more tans and browns, the more undulating and more to the level uh, landscape. I'll just We also have a lot of land cover data, not land use data. I get so frustrated when I see land use, land cover maps up and they call it land use data. There's a distinction, but we don't have time today to get into that. So we have uh, land cover, I've actually got 2011 now, down to 30 meter pixel for all of the agricultural area actually across Canada, if folks are interested. And being able to look at the areas here, what you're seeing is in the pale yellow, essentially it's agriculture, either annual cropland or permanent cover. The greens start getting into treed areas. The orange is um, native range, kind of more grassland, natural grassland areas. So you'll see the vermilion is largely an agricultural uh, type watershed, predominantly agricultural. There is a lot of oil and gas activities, so, and, and that's something that we can't uh, forget. Uh, Les talked about uh, when the water, most of the water gets into the North Saskatchewan, we're back to the North Saskatchewan here, is mainly in the headwaters. This area, most of Alberta, is very, very arid. Uh, essentially, it's uh, evaporation exceeds, evapotranspiration exceeds precipitation. It's just we're in the rain shadow of the mountains. And that's important to understand. For the vermilion, which is in this area here, we found that some of the rainfall levels on average actually are nearly twice what is at the confluence with the river. Now again, it's not a lot because they're in a kind of a dry, arid area, but it is important in understanding the, the form and the function in the watershed. Contributing areas. Uh, now this is uh, an interesting concept. You could have an entire gross drainage area of a watershed, but again, on dry prairie kind of conditions, based on a one to two year flood scenario, only in the Vermilion, 30% of the area, the total area, is actually effective or contributing runoff. So understanding, again, that distribution of, again, the form and function of the landscape is important. When we looked, in talking with the, the fellows with the steering committee, looking at the different issues and identifying. Initially, they had a list of over 100 issues. Well, how do you manage that? You have to start categorizing and prioritizing. And then with those main issues, what are the goals? How can we alleviate those issues? What are the goals and, and set that? And then the form of the, the plan started to come from the goals. Then we had the management directions, which were essentially the recommendations, and then the specific actions. And we listed who needs to be involved. We got into some hot water about that, but. We were paralleling at the time the NSWA's IWMP and there was a lot of lessons that we learned at the sub-watershed level from what the NSWA was going through with their IWMP and we felt again at the local level it was important if, if you can't name who has the jurisdiction, my goodness why are you even getting together to do the plan. And then the whole process and the need for public uh, engagement consultation that affirmed where we were coming from. Uh, at the committee level. And here's, uh, I don't know if you can see it at the back, I hope you can. The main categories of issues gravitated <coughs> to the three areas of surface water, groundwater, and the watershed or landscape. And priority issues at the time, uh, sedimentation, wetland loss and alteration, base flow issues, lack of enforcement, that was brought up uh, in some of the earlier presentations as well. 
again, just the capacity of uh, uh, different agencies. Groundwater supply and sustainability, groundwater quality, recreation issues, repair and health issues, land clearing and alteration. Those were the top priorities. At the same time, we were doing a bunch of research. Um, initially, uh, Dave True, the executive director, had the foresight to know that we needed a water supply demand study for the Vermilion before we actually got the committee together so we had some current compiled information. So Golder and Associates did the water supply demand study. We then contracted through again the help of Alberta Nawal, Dr. John Pomeroy and his team at the U of S uh, to do some uh, uh, hydrologic modeling and he used the Cold Regions Hydrologic Model or CRIM. At University of Alberta, there's a group, uh, Dr. Carl Steins and his crew, developing a rapid assessment tool on non-cultivated areas, so essentially riparian areas, native grasslands, whatever, using remote sensing. That's underway. And myself, uh, Graham Watt, the former basin planner with NSWA, we developed a technical advisory committee, a TAC, for the Vermilion. Anne-Marie Anderson sat on that. Sharon Redick, our water quality specialist with uh, Ag Canada out of Edmonton, and Lake Clan County's uh, instructor, Michael Crow, and a bunch of others. And we developed, uh, this is at a draft point right now, we're trying to meld it into what to Les was saying with the, the monitoring framework for IH and or the basin, it is a sub-watershed monitoring system and indicators f specifically for the Vermilion. Talking about the water supply demand study, this is a hydrograph from a dry year at Marwain, which is almost at the confluence of uh, uh, the Vermilion River with the uh, North Saskatchewan. And it's taken dry years back from 1998 to 2007, and the daily flow here in cubic meters per second is not quite three. And you can see the variability. And the big thing we learned from the water supply demand study is that river, and it was alluded to earlier, you know, goodness help those poor people, <laughs> the Vermilion Rivers Operation Committee, trying to control those structures and control flows and stuff. This river has no averages. And I'll just show you what a wet year is like. This is a wet year. Again, daily flow, meter, cubic meters per second, nearly 50. Previous in the dry years, it was barely three. So the variability on this prairie tributary little river of the North Saskatchewan. Actually in the drought years when we started, a lot of guys said, do we even have a river left? It's not flowing. You know, it was just such a dry time. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the research from CRIM, uh, there's been different presentations, like yesterday Jay talked about some of the classification, the policy and, and stuff like that. The Cold Regions Hydrologic Model didn't get into any of the classification of the wetlands or whatever. We had a wonderful inventory done by Ducks Unlimited in 2004 to gather information on existing and historically drained wetlands for the Vermilion. And that uh, data, that inventory is actually available online. If you go Ducks and Wetland Inventory, just Google that, it'll come up. It's a web-based type mapping thing. You can look at it. What Pomeroy's team looked at was the whole science behind prairie and frozen uh, conditions on fill and spill. So, if I remember the word hysteresis, am I saying it right? Uh, I always thought it was hysterical, but anyway. The whole thing of fill and spill, how important is that on prairie in prairie systems? So, what Krim really looked at was snow accumulation and melt, wetland storage and drainage, soil moisture storage, evapotranspiration runoff, and stream routing. And again, considering frozen systems, we have six months on average of winter in this country, so this is uh, important. And then he did different scenarios looking at wetland restoration and drainage scenarios based on either upper or lower position within the sub-sub, almost down to the sub, three subs, sub-sub-sub watershed level. And what's also the impact on the size of the wetlands, whether they're large or small. So various scenarios were done. And he identified a gatekeeper effect. The importance of large wetlands in controlling drainage networks, contributing area, and basin connectivity cannot be under understated. Um, and it was interesting to note the area of wetlands in the Vermilion River watershed was actually relatively small. With the data that we had, and they could only go back to aerial photos back to 1949, 
the area of wetlands, aerial extent of wetlands in 2006 was 6%, and in 1949, 7.4%. Really not a big change. One would maybe think more, but remember I mentioned Holden drainage district's been in place since 1918. A lot of that impact uh, happened, you know, over 100 years ago, or nearly. The monitoring system, what we looked at with the monitoring system and the indicators, surface water quality monitoring, groundwater monitoring, and the indicators. Three types of indicators were identified, process, pressure, and condition. Condition indicators, also called state indicators. And we can do a whole afternoon on indicators, but that's just a... And then we had, I don't know if you can see the stars at the back of the room, they looked at what historically had happened on the Vermilion. Right now there's 14 Water Survey of Canada monitoring sites. Some are current, some are historical. And since the 1970s, Alberta Environment had actually done 39 different sampling sites along the Vermilion over that time. So the data was sparse, there was some historical stuff. Is there anything current and really good? No, it needs a, a monitoring system. The public engagement, how is my time doing? Two minutes. Uh, we, at various stages of the plan development, we had a fairly significant public engagement process. In January, February, we targeted again, with the emphasis on the municipalities, we wanted to target the planners to find out if, again, the language we were using, the lingo, the lexicon of watershed planning was in their planning vocabulary. So we asked them for feedback on the use of either general information as it pertains science-based information for watershed planning, information and tools, and usefulness in their planning, whether or not it was recognized in statutory documents and or non-statutory documents. And we have some really fantastic results from that. We then brought them all together for a workshop and again talked about that and tried to carry that forward into the plan. Once the draft plan was ready, we called it a discussion paper, much again learning from what the uh, NSWA's IWMP process was. We did the draft plan and then had the survey accompany that, kind of a reply feedback thing. Both online, we had open houses, municipal forums, uh, it was uh, crazy busy it, using clickers, you know, the meeting clickers, you know, people can respond right at the thing. And then we incorporated whatever feedback we could. We actually went through a process of, you get all this feedback, do you incorporate it all? No, but you have to justify why and not. And, and Leah, I think you mentioned that. Your process is probably similar. So getting into the recommendations, I'm probably running out of time here and it's soon to lunch. This is an excerpt of some of this focus on more BMPs and that's our next steps with implementation. The big one on the knowledge and capacity was again, trying to coordinate and cooperate uh, communications with all the planning initiatives and types of planning, again formal land use planning versus watershed planning and everything in between and whatever ELSA and land use framework might be. Adopt, develop and integrate aquatic ecosystem health objectives into planning decision making. Uh, when we first started the work on aquatic ecosystem uh, health, uh, again it was a foreign term to our planners. It was just like, you want what? So develop and implement management strategies and plans to protect groundwater quality and quantity. So as we move from the planning phase now, we just completed the plan. It was officially printed in December. We got it done last fall to implementation now. We're going to go the route of working groups, subcommittees. Uh, I've heard some of the projects, uh, different watershed groups call them standing committees or subcommittees. We're calling them task teams. We've got three identified thus far. And the really encouraging thing is most of the stakeholders, the members that were on the steering committee, want to continue on in the implementation, on the implementation team. So that's really reassuring. We're hoping that there will be more and new partners as well. Our linkages back to NSWA, this vermilion critter, creature is kind of taking on its own life. And, and with that, we still want things aligned. Obviously, as things move forward, it has to be aligned. And how the implementation team manages its local working groups and as well liaises with the NSWA's expert working groups as they go to implementation. We're working all those details out. <coughs> I'd like to acknowledge again the steering committee implementation team without the fellows around the table, the local knowledge. And they're, you know, again, they have such a rich history of knowledge that none of us have. They're living and walking that 
land, those, those water supplies every day. NSWA, of course, uh, Ducks Unlimited, Alberta Nawomp, uh, provincial partners, ASRD and Alberta Ag, and my old cohort, Graham Watt, was the basin planner with NSWA when we first started the Vermillion. He's now moved on to some work in British Columbia, doing fantastic, but uh, it wouldn't have been done uh, without those people. So, thank you. Oh, and I just want to make a, sorry, <laughs> Pat was supposed to be here. Pat's the, Pat Gr Patrick Gortenko is our chairperson, but he's busy, he got called away to municipal stuff today, so uh, call either of us if you have questions, or all the reports are on the NSWA website. So, thank you.